The podcast you're about to hear involves true stories, which may contain graphic content that is not suitable for children. Listener's discretion is advised. This is Esoteric Oddities. Hey guys. Hey, I'm striking your levels. It's okay, I turned the volume down. Ha oh, ha, wow. gotcha. Hello. Welcome to our show. This is the Sarah and John show. My name's first because I'm the most important. Oh, and it also is alphabetical. I have to admit, I'm a little spacey today. He's not a little, like he's a lot. I just walked upstairs in like circles in my kitchen. I was like, why did I come up here? Have you guys ever done that? Sound off in the comments below. <laughs> right. More times than not. Um, Jonathan went to this karaoke place yesterday and I was supposed to go, but I called him and I was crying and I had a mental breakdown. And that's so, I stayed so home. fine. Well, you also had a migraine and I'm like my ears right now. It, have you guys been to a show? That was so fucking loud. No, that was my only question. Oh. Have you been to a show? Sound <laughs> off in the comments below. No, but we were standing next to the speakers. It was like a cover band oh. and like my ears are really fuck it's everything's muffled my head hurts i'm pregnant i'm shaky like i'm shaky as fuck like i hate that actually, that's why i'm like okay now i think my blood sugar's low but i'm just gonna go ahead and take this time to call out my cousin because i went to go eat a piece of chocolate and he put the entire bag of chocolate back with the wrappers like using it as a trash can so mark you know that's the fucking worst it's like someone when someone puts like an empty cereal box back like here's the th okay i don't i don't <laughs> want to go off on a tangent but i'm going to mark you better be listening because he'll we had like an entire oh, canister. He does this. yeah we had an entire <gasps> canister of raisins and he left like four in there he's like well i didn't want to be rude and like take the last of it. I was you like, took this the is last a, this is more of a slap in the face than not doing it love you mark but please throw out the raisins and chocolate like and rebuy no, I'm not even worried about that. Oh, like I'd rather hear about like because if, if I open the cabinet and I see oh there's raisins maybe I'll snack on oh, them later and then I'm like oh I can't wait to sit on my couch and eat my raisins. Opening them and not seeing raisins, you're not gonna think. Yeah, and then raisins. I have four fucking raisins. Do you know how long that's gonna last me? Not very long at all. You literally pop four in your mouth at once. I do one at a time. I like to cherish each each raisin. You're disgusting, like a serial killer. Yeah, well I call him like I say him. That, did, that didn't even work. See, guys, this is where my head's at today. You're bleeding all over the studio. Guys, we're back in the studio. We haven't been here in a minute. That's why you, like, I went to go sit down at your kitchen table. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, what is happening? Stop. What is happening? I'm bleeding. Oh, God. If you get blood on my brand new a used Toro carpet. A Toro You fucking knew I was going to say <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> I hate it. Uh... So I went to hang out with my friend and her newborn baby, and this baby is really comfortable around me. First time I held her in the hospital, like right after she was born, was the first time that um, she let a really nasty loud fart out. <laughs> she like arched her back. This newborn baby like oh, echoed in while I'm holding her. I was like, okay, I guess we're on that level. So then um, a couple of days ago, I strategically waited till like 30-ish minutes after she had eaten her formula to hold her you know she got burped and all that and i'm like okay cool give me the baby i want right. to hold her so she's chilling on my lap for a little bit she hiccups a little bit and then projectile vomits all over at me. least it didn't go in your mouth this time oh wait oh honey it's bee. better oh, wait honey, honey, honey bee. <laughs> so it was the last time i was there and i was like it's fine even though i mean it's kind of nasty but i stayed at her house for like two more hours with like vomit soaked in my clothes we but, love that but she's and baby so vomit cute stinks. it does and she's hypoallergenic so she was on like a new formula uh -huh. that it really it smells like um like you know annie's the their mac and cheese oh. it's like gluten-free like v whatever it is yeah. it's like fake stuff it, that the powder it smelled like that ew yeah um but i can't be mad at her because she's so cute but the thing is she smiles after she threw up on me projectile like this wasn't spit up it was like shot inches out from her face and landed all over my pants so then um the other night i was over there again and <laughs> she ate and then she was getting changed and then she like spit up a little and then sneezed and it went all over my face all over my glasses and a little bit in my mouth <laughs> I cannot. I know what the fuck. Why am I telling you why this? Why do people want children? Just kidding. Oh, but she's so cute. I know. That's why they want them. I know. She's adorable and she likes me. 
Um, I put peppermint oil all over my bed because <laughs> um, <laughs> it's summer and I don't oh, want bugs. Well, it's about to be nice out and I don't want bugs. And um, I yeah, didn't know. It's not know... summer. It's like the third day of spring. Yeah, it's 70 degrees out. It's summer, bitch. Oh, God. Just kidding. I didn't know that it was extremely toxic to cats. So I was literally up all night, like, terrified that I was going to wake up to, like, my cat dead in my bed. Yeah, isn't there... <sighs> How like there's a lot of essential oils you're not supposed yeah. to put in a diffuser for a cat, like, aren't cinnamon, there? Cinnamon, uh, lavender, peppermint oil. Hmm, that's interesting. That's scary. It also, like scary. house plants kind of scare me. Yeah, you like, have to you, look up the ones that are okay yeah. for cats. Like, but, like what's like, that Christmas plant? Poinsettias. poinsettias. I hate people who say poinsettia. I was gonna say that. Bitch, where's the extra letters? And even if that's how you say it, I hate it. Okay. I said it in my head like that. Poinsettia. Poinsettia. Points. I think it's poinsettia. It is. I don't fucking care what it is. Hey guys. So today's uh, <laughs> topic is deadly expeditions, and I do believe I'm going to go first. Okay. I what was just your... checking to make sure we were recording, and we were. Can you imagine if we didn't record that whole thing? That would suck a lot. <laughs> oh God. There was one time, like years ago, I was doing a, a YouTube collab, mm-hmm. and I wasn't recording audio the whole time. So. That was a funny video that that. never got to go out. Okay, hold on. I need to sip my water. Okay. So this is the unexpectedly fucked up story of the Donner Party. Have you heard of? No. Excellent. So this case is really well documented uh, because so many people were involved and they all kept diaries with like specific dates and stuff because this happened a long time ago. Let's blast to the past. Pack your bag. Uh, Bring your warm clothes. I would suggest comfortable shoes because we're going to be walking a lot and we're going to blast off to April 17th, 1847 here in the United States of America. On April 17th, 1847, Thomas Fallon and nine other members of a search party ended their 78-day extensive search when they came across their worst nightmare. Human bodies, arms, legs, and skulls scattered around a makeshift cabin. The body of a woman lay in the doorway, her limbs severed with a brutal gash in her skull. Her flesh had been almost entirely consumed. Just eight miles away, in a second cabin, the search party found a large iron kettle filled with human flesh. Oh, shit. Next to it, a man's body lay with his head split open. His brains had already been eaten. Thomas Fallon and the rest of the search party had found what they were looking for. But let's start at the beginning. So I'm going to go back 366 days before. So oh, a was full, 666. A full year and one day, ironically, because in 1846, if you didn't know, many Americans trekked the Oregon Trail uh, to manifest destiny. So they were looking for a better life in the uncharted territory of the West Coast. Most Americans living in the Midwest heard of the West Coast uh, being, you know, the land of milk and honey. Why did people call it that? I guess because that used to be like luxurious. But if you consume milk and honey together it's like straight up diorama like it's gonna pour out of you like lava i think that was like 360 years ago was like when people actually drank milk now everyone drinks oat milk what are you talking no, 300 i this is 366 days before oh no i'm just saying well back then i feel like that i was it's... and i also feel like our world wasn't fucked and we had actual farms and now we can't grow Girl, any our crops. world was so fucked and problematic in the 1800s in america baby you yeah, want to talk they were about still racism able to and farm <laughs> yeah they had i think they no i think it was a fucked up time also okay they could farm why are you doing <laughs> okay so milk and honey don't uh don't eat them together also like i i really do think milk and honey was like a thing for it was like luxurious it was what the rich people could have do you know what i mean because like if you look at old paintings it's they, always milk or and like honey. no it's not always milk let me fucking finish my thought don't assume assume don't assume make you ass out of you and me but a lot of the times people would be painted with a bowl of oranges because only rich people back then could like afford oranges oh really and i'm like milk and honey I'm just gonna <laughs> shut the fuck up. no don't shut up <laughs> grow up 
and when I look at you, I throw up. Like, uh. like a baby all over <laughs> me and my face. Okay, back to this. So, um... These pioneers, again, they wanted to go from the Midwest. They wanted to go to the West Coast. And the pioneers, they they heard of tales of people, you know, coming across gold. And there was fertile land and warmer weather. And it's kind of just what everybody wanted. So on April 16th, 1846, the family of brothers George and Jacob Donner and uh, and the family of James F. Reed left Springfield, Illinois. So... It's like, I'm going to refer to it as a party or a group, but literally it's just like a group of pioneers on a trail, you know, how you stereotypically would think of like the Oregon Trail. Right. You know what I mean? So there were 33 people in this group with nine wagons and they made it to Missouri on May 10th, at which point a bunch of people merged into that same traveling party, which was common back then. So they didn't really know these people, but they were going to because it was just like safety in numbers, like let's all travel this together and, you know. It, I guess it would be better to travel in uncharted land together. With, yeah, with a, a bunch more people. Right. So, so now it went from thirty-three people um, from Illinois. Now they're in Missouri, and there's eighty-seven emigrants traveling together, uh, and their wagons were led by oxen. So. Again, the group consisted of numerous families of men, women, and children. The group of travelers were led by, again, brothers George and Jacob Donner, where they earned their infamous title, the Donner Party. So the Donner Party also sometimes is referred to as the Donner-Reed Party. And I'll get into that because the Donner family and the Reed family kind of began butting heads a little bit on who was taking the reins on this. But uh, I'm just going to refer to it as the Donner Party. So... The Donner Party plans their travels while following a guidebook titled The Emigrant's Guide to Oregon and California. And it was by this guy named Lansford Hastings, who was a 28-year-old lawyer. So this was pretty much the only available guide that they had that was going to take them to California rather than Oregon. Did I call it Oregon? Oregon. Origami. (laughs) Is, isn't it Oregon? Oregon, Oregon. Uh, it's going to be one of those words that I just think about. And tomato, I just... tomato. I exactly. mean, who the fuck calls it tomato? No one, but it's acceptable. So say what you want. Oh, thank you, baby. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is important. So pay attention to this. So like I said, this guy that they're following to go to California rather than follow the traditional Oregon Trail is is pretty much the only guide that's available to them. So at the time in America, the Mexican-American War was going on and President James Polk wanted to take California from Mexico. And this guidebook by Hastings made California again sound like a motherfucking paradise. So again, most travelers went to Oregon following the Oregon Trail, but uh, from Missouri to the Continental Divide, traveling about 15 miles or 24 kilometers a day over the course of four to six months. That was what people traditionally did. But uh, this guidebook was going to take them to California. So author Lansford Hastings, who again was 28 fucking years old and a lawyer, like, um, excuse me, can I see your credentials? Thank you. So he wanted people to go to California because Hastings was working with a Swedish immigrant named John Sutter, who actually founded Sutterville, California. So Sutter promised Hastings a huge amount of money and land in Sutterville if Hastings would guide people to California rather than Oregon. Are you following me? So with his ulterior motive, Hastings wrote about a shortcut which later would be referred to as the Hastings Cutoff. So Hastings claimed his cutoff would make the trip uh, hundreds of miles shorter. They would get there quicker. But when he published this guide, get this shit, Lansford Hastings had never fucking traveled this route. He had only seen it topically on a map. So looking at it, he's like, okay, yeah, point A to point B. (laughs) That's a shorter distance, right? But none of the travelers who were reading this guidebook knew that. So he had his ulterior motive that he was going to get land and shit and money in California. So that's why he's doing this. So the first mistake was made before they even left. So the Donner Party should have left their Midwest home in Missouri by May 1st at the latest. But instead, they left weeks late on May 12th. So they travel for 76 days. And by July 27th, the Donner Party makes it to one of their first stops, which was Fort Bridger. So Fort Bridger um, was really close to this fork in the road. So like one trail would take you back to the Oregon Trail. Oregon Trail. Oh, my God. Fuck my ass. Um, And the other one would take you to the Hastings Cutoff. So 
some pioneers in a separate party that was ahead of the Donners had taken the Hastings cutoff, but they fucking turned around. They were like, yo, that cutoff may have been shorter, but it was a hell of a lot harder to travel. Um, so these pioneers then took, like, they came back to Fort Bridger and then they took the, um, the traditional Oregon Trail. Oregon Trail, whatever you want to call it, and they went their separate way. So unless the Donner Party was planning on wasting days of travel and their oxen's energy before changing their mind and turning back around, because that would that could potentially take days for them to decide to turn around. Then as if it took them four days to get there, it could take them four days to get back. And they just wasted time and energy and supplies. Um just to get to the fort and then go on the fu- on a fucking longer trail, right? So um, unless they wanted to do that, Fort Bridger was pretty much the last stop before their point of no return. Wow. So one of the men who had traveled the Hastings cutoff before the Donner Party, he um, before the Donner Party even got to the fort, um, he was this journalist named Edwin Bryant who had rode his horse to see the cutoff. So he didn't have a wagon; it was just him and his good old horse, um, probably named Ed. Name that movie. Name that show. I don't remember. I was hoping you would know. What is it, Ed? Ed, yeah, Ed the horse. It was like a talking horse. <laughs> oh, the cartoon. Is no, it on Netflix? No, no. Oh, I don't know then. It. The name of the show is Mr. Ed. Wow, fuck me. <laughs> Shut up. Mr. Ed the talking horse. Uh, if you'd like to go see that, look it up on uh, www.google.com com uh not sponsored so again this dude who traveled before the donners had even arrived his name was edwin bryant he rode with his horse to the cutoff on his horse edwin saw that the shortcut was fucking rough and it was not a good trail for wagons so he turned around and he went to fort bridger so edwin was smart and he was trying to be helpful and he left letters telling people not to take the cutoff but the guy who owned fort bridger intervened because it was in the fort owner's best interest to have people take the cutoff because generally if they weren't taking the cutoff pioneers wouldn't even come across his fort as that would kind of be out of out of the way and not they wouldn't really be in that direction so the fort bridger owner concealed the fucking letters telling people not to go that way and didn't tell any travelers about the warnings so um Mm -mm. James Reed, however, they had heard some people talking about it, but they didn't get the letter. So they had verbally heard people being like, hey, I heard it's like kind of rough. And people said, maybe don't go to California and just go to Oregon. And like, but it's like, "Mm, what do we want to do here? So hearing of the warnings, but not seeing the hidden letters, James Reed, which was the the head dude from the Reed family, if you couldn't tell, he began arguing with the Donner brothers. So Reed insisted that they took the Hastings cutoff. They said that they would travel hundreds of miles less. Um, Now, it's important to note that James Reed wasn't very liked by the others in the party. They had already been together for like 70 some days and they all were getting to know each other because they didn't have Candy Crush. They literally were forced to like talk to each other. Um, at least the ones who were on the wagon. So he was, uh, James Reed was aloof. He was rude. He was the type of guy who thought he was better than everyone. And he kind of liked to let others know that. So Reed and the Donners went back and forth. And ultimately they followed Reed's idea to take the Hastings cut off. So... Um, I'm going to be spitting out dates left and right because the travelers kept diaries. Now, I saw a couple of these dates were um, contradicting each other on different sources, but I think that's based off of whose diary you're reading. Mm -hmm. Because again, these travelers have been traveling and I mean, some of them are going to lose track of the days, but regardless, (laughs) just pay attention to the dates and the time of the year. Uh, Okay, so on July 31st, 1846, the Donner Party left Fort Bridger and began their expedition through the Hastings Cutoff. So some people um, had decided to take the Oregon Trail instead. So now they're uh, from whatever they originally had. They're now down to 74 people and 20 wagons in the Donner Party. Mm -hmm. So within days, they found the terrain to be much more difficult than anticipated. Okay, so the wagon drivers were forced to lock the wheels of their wagons to prevent them from rolling down steep inclines. Also remember that several years of traffic on the main Oregon Trail had left like an easy, obvious path of like a literal dart path that people could see. But the Hastings cutoff hadn't really been traveled almost at all. So it was like really difficult to you know, they're following a map, but they're like, is this where I'm supposed to fucking be? Like, I don't know. We're just kind of winging it, dude. Um, out here, just us and nature. Am I right? What's better than that? Guys being dudes. I can't. Uh, so 
They encountered exceedingly difficult canyons where boulders had to be fucking moved. Like the guys were hopping out of their wagons and they were like, yo, we have to fucking push this boulder out of the way. Um, th there were steep rocky roots that almost broke their wagon wheels. So rock me mama like a wagon wheel. I was gonna say that. Rock me mom any way you feel. They played that last night. It like echoes in my head. I'm just like, I can't. Sometimes Rock like me. those those out there suburban boonies um, really bars are. that we like to go to are just really something else. I don't quite fit in, but that's okay. Oh my God. I saw my, uh, my high school teacher there. That makes sense. She was my high school science teacher and I she she definitely didn't. It? Oh yeah. She was getting... Miss B. She also looked really good. Like, holy shit. Yes. yes. We love a glow up. Um, um, I wanted to grind on her just to say I did it, but her husband was there and he looked like he could suck the shit out of me. Oh, God. Anyway, back to the Donner Party. So, again, the Donner Party's progress slowed to about a mile and a half a day. So they're moving at a mile and a half a day, whereas if they would have took the Oregon Trail, it would be about 14, 15 miles a day of smooth sailing, baby. Uh, might have took a little bit longer, but uh, I think we're going to learn a lesson here. What do you think? So all able-bodied men were required to clear bush, to clear trees. They had to, move again, move fucking rocks out of the way to make a path for these wagons. So three months into their emigration, on August 25th, they made it to the Great Salt Lake Desert, where the first Donner Party member, Luke Holleran died of tuberculosis, and in retrospect, I would call this guy lucky. So the party rested their oxen and prepared um, for the rest of their trip. After 36 hours, they set off traveling a 1,000-foot mountain that lay in their path. So yeah. now they got to hike up this fucking mountain on their wagons with their oxen. And also remember, like, oxen, they're huge, but, like, you've got to feed them. Yeah, they're slow, but you got to fucking feed them. Like, this is going to become an issue. So in the heat of the day, the moisture under the salt crust rose to the surface of the ground, and it turned the soil into a gummy molasses-like mass, and the wheels of the wagon sank into it and in some cases it went up to the hubs I cannot. so the days were blistering hot and the nights were frigid and on september 3rd 1846 it was their third day in the desert and their water supply was gone out. look third day third day in the desert so several people of the group saw visions of lakes and uh, wagon trains and they believed they had finally you know oh traveled entirely through the Hastings cutoff but they were fucking wrong there was no water there was no wagon trail ahead um it was all like in their head do you remember that game we used to play in school and it used to be like it was like Marco Polo no it was set like really back western time and there was like an ox and like a fucking wagon where was your childhood? I don't know. An ox Fuck. and a wagon? What are you yeah, talking? Yeah, and it was like a computer game. Oh, the Oregon Trail. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, I thought I'd reference that. Maybe I should have referenced it better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember that. I was. Th I thought you meant like at recess. Like oh, I was no, like. No, 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 no. I was like, Sarah, where the did fuck they, were you at? Did they, I was in the Midwest. <laughs> we would fucking do that. Right. Uh, God, problematic. All right, so um, that night. Get this, that night, nine out of the Reed family's 10 thirsty oxen ran off, causing the Reeds to take a few things and set out on foot. So their oxen were never fucking found. And some of the other oxen were so weakened that they were abandoned and left to die. Wow. So, they could have ate that. <sighs> I'm sorry. But like survival here okay foreshadowing i don't know <laughs> so uh many of the family's cattle horses and dogs had also broken free and gone missing we assume they fucking died this they're in the desert and I there's not so they're already running low on energy so september 8th 1846 the immigrants finished their five-day journey across the 80 mile desert which hastings said was half as wide. So instead of the promised two-day journey over 40 miles, uh, they traveled 80 miles of this desert, and it took them six days. Mm -hmm. So a lot of their time was also wasted uh, when they were trying to recover the runaway cattle and retrieve the wagons, because if the fucking nine of your 10 oxen, which are pulling your wagon run away, what the fuck are you going to do with right. the one last lonely oxen who probably is like, uh, where did everybody go? <laughs> Who turned the lights out? <laughs> uh, it's not funny. It's not funny. It's not funny. Um, so here's something fucked up. At this point, the Donner Party had lost 36 oxen. Also, how do you have that many oxen? It was back then. Okay. What did they, what did they start out with? 
uh, a lot more than that, but they lost, <laughs> they lost 36, okay? So September 10th, 1846, after taking inventory of their supplies, they realized they don't have enough food for them to make it to California. So there's two men, these heroes. Uh, one dude, Charles Stanton, who we'll come back to, and this guy named William McCutcheon traveled ahead <gasps> to Sutter's Fort to request more. So they were like, hey, we're going to go. We're just going to take what we can take, and we're going to take our horses, and we're going to fucking get there as fast as we can. We're going to grab food, and then we'll meet you back here. Lord. We'll text you. Just kidding. They didn't have phones back then. 1846, baby. Um, so... Uh, September 26th, 1846, they, uh, the whole party arrives at the Homebalt River, where the cutoff meets the Standard Trail, which was actually 125 miles shorter than the Hastings Cutoff. Suck on my titties. Remember, they left in May, and by now we're about to get into October. So the families in the party actually split off. This is going to get a little confusing. So they're kind of splitting off into now two groups, and then those two guys who are far ahead, right? So the Donner family... And others went ahead, and then the Reed family and some others were trailing behind. So the Donner Party ended up actually being a full day ahead of them with the main wagon. Um, and in both groups, tensions were high between people. People were arguing. Everybody was tired. They were trying to figure out what they were going to do without much options. Um, again, they were hungry, tired, and slow. They were moving fucking slow. So two wagons in one group... Um, became tangled and a man named John Snyder was fucking angry and it happened to be one of James Reed's oxen so he actually beat one of James Reed's oxen so when Reed intervened Snyder took the whip on him Ah. Reed retaliated by stabbing a knife under Snyder's collarbone John Snyder stumbled back fell to the ground and fucking died so the first Donner Party murder had taken place place they're out here killing people because they're hungry it gets real so that evening the witnesses gathered to discuss what was to be done morally because they in the united states the united states laws were not actually applicable Mm -hmm. west of the continental divide because then it was mexican territory um and everyone who everyone saw snyder hit james reed first and some claimed that uh snyder had also hit james wife margaret but snyder had been liked and popular, whereas Reed was not. It's always the popular one. Right, but Snyder shouldn't have fucking turned the whip on Reed because I'm not saying I'm not saying Reed killing him was justified, but he wasn't he wasn't coming at Snyder from a place of like, fuck you don't hit my like oxen like I love animals and shit. They were like, if you hit my oxen, I nine of my ten are gone. This is like my one left, and right. they traded I off need somewhere. It. I fucking need. We we, <laughs> we all need, need that it. to to continue. Right. So you know, just gonna put that out there. So one man suggested that James Reed should be hanged, but uh, eventually a compromise allowed Reed uh, allowed Reed his life, but they forced him to leave camp without his family who were taken care of by the others. So Reed departed alone the next morning, unarmed, but his daughter Virginia rode ahead and secretly gave him food and a rifle. Um, And then she went back and joined the the rest of the party. The following day, James Reed caught up with the Donner party, who was a little bit ahead of them. And instead of staying with the party, James Reed pieces out. He just kind of passes him and he's like, yo, what's up? I got kicked out. Yeah, I fucking killed somebody. What are you going to do about it? So he went ahead and he went straight to California. So the next day, which was October 7th, an elderly Belgian man named Mr. Hardcoop, or that's at least what he's referred to in these diaries, was sitting in the back of the wagon when another man named Louis Kessberg shoved Mr. Hardcoop out of his wagon uh, to lighten the load, saying, everyone who can walk is walking. Mr. Hardcoop was last seen sitting by the road until he faded into the distance and no one ever saw him again. Oh. This is how brutal it was. Like, it was survival. It was doggy dog, doggy dog, every man for themselves. So on the night of October 11th, 1846, a group of local Native Americans killed 21 of the Donner Party's oxen. So shortly thereafter, a couple nights later, uh, the same Native Americans stole 18 oxen and wounded several others while the party was asleep. So now more than 100 of the Donner Party's cattle are gone either missing or dead, probably all dead. So since all of his cattle's gone, there's this German emigrant named uh, Wolfinger, and he stopped to the Humboldt sink to stock his wagon on October 13th. Two other men, uh, Joseph Reinhardt and Augustus Spitzer, stayed behind to help him. Um, 
but they returned back with the other group of people and they weren't with Wolfinger. And they said that he had been killed by Native Americans. However, Joseph Reinhardt would later confess on his deathbed that he and his friend Augustus murdered Wolfinger for his money and goods. Ooh. Okay, so by late October of 1846, the Donner Party had made it to Truckee Lake. Everybody was fucking run down. They were exhausted, starving, low on supplies, extremely fucking low on supplies. So Charles Stanton, remember that dude who went to California? Yeah. Homeboy, he returns oh, from yeah. Stuttersburg. He's like, y'all, it's the land Thank of milk and honey. You're going to love it when you get there. So he had successfully made it to their final destination. Love that movie. Uh, and he returned back to them, which was a fucking sight for sore eyes. So along with him, Stanton had brought brought uh, seven mules loaded with food, supplies, and two Muak Native American guides named Louis and Salvador, who didn't speak much English, but they were going to help them get to uh, California. So Stan told the group that the pass through the Sierras should be open for another month. And then on October 30th, 1846, a man named William Foster accidentally shot his brother-in-law, William Pike, who died. Uh, his burial was held in the Truckee Canyon, and during his burial, it began to snow. So this what is what can go wrong, right? So this certain type of snow is actually caused by the Pineapple Express. I love that smoke. Love that movie. Love that strain. Um, it actually has a really official like name. I don't know how to fucking say it, so I'm not going to. But basically, what the Pineapple Express phenomena is, uh, it's cold air. It gets sucked up by warm, moist air, and it causes rain and snow on the West Coast. So the Donner Party didn't know it yet, but by the end of the year, they were going to be faced with 22 feet of fucking snow. October 31st. It was Halloween of 1846. The front axle of George Donner's... Uh, Family wagon breaks, and while he's making a new one, he severely cuts his hand. So George and his brother Jacob's group lagged a little bit behind while the rest of the party moved on. So November 1st, they had traveled 2,500 miles, or 4,023 kilometers, and they are only 120 miles from Sutter's Fort their final destination in California. They're so close compared to how much they've traveled. Oh my God, yeah. It's like that loading screen and then it's at that last like and 92. And forever. You're at 92%. 90%, remember that? Nine, why did we think that was so funny? I don't know. We were watching Honey, We Shrunk Ourselves <laughs> and what's his name? I don't remember his name, but he's like 90%. We thought it was so funny. We thought so it was so funny. funny. We said it like for a whole month. It's not even it's funny. It's really not. <laughs> it's that inside joke that has no backstory. And everyone's it's just like stupid. crickets. I blink. <laughs> 90%. So stupid. Anyway, um, the Donners held up by their accident were still behind, but the snow kept fucking falling and it was falling quick. So now there was unpassable snow and the Donner party had to build four cabins at Truckee Lake to wait out the season. How awful to be like, dude, that we can't, we have to fucking stay here for a season and we have to survive this shit. Like they had to make that decision because they knew they weren't, if they traveled, it was going to be fucked. Right. So they're just like, oh shit, man. At some point in November 1846, the two sections of the Donner Party camp for the winter. So one cabin is built, and then about 200 yards away, another cabin is built against a boulder. And about a half a mile away, another double cabin is built. Um, and trailing behind, six miles back at the location known as Alder Creek, the Donner family sets up. So it, this whole party, they're kind of stretched out, but the Donner family oh, yeah, themselves... Like, we don't want nothing to do with you. Peace. No, 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 no. It wasn't that. It was because oh. he injured his hand. Oh, right, so right. they trailed back a little bit, but they were like, go ahead, we'll catch up with you. But then the snow happened and they're like, we can't catch up with oh, you. Right, so right. Their, tra their camp, the Donner's family, not the Don Donner party, the actual family themselves is six miles behind. <laughs> um, so everybody else has cabins and the Donner party pretty much had to set up a fucking tent. And they tried to make a bush shelter out of, like, the shit that they had, but they weren't making, like, a log cabin thing. So we've got a majority of the party at Truckee Lake and then six miles away. Again, we have the Donner family at Alder Creek. So um, I'm just going to say that at Alder Creek Camp, the Donner family, we got George Donner, who's 60 years old, his wife, Tamson Donner, who's 44, and their five children, aged 13, 11, 6, 4, and 3. And then we've also got in the same camp, uh, we've got George's brother, Jacob Donner, who's 56, his wife, Elizabeth, who's 40, and their seven children, aged 14, 12, 9, 7, 5, 4, and 3. 
damn, they were fucking like bunnies. How did they bring our kids? They were moving. I know. Everything. Why, what but are they like, going to do? Yeah, I guess they could have FedEx some. Yeah, it's just super cute. Why didn't they box. just take Spirit Air? Like, you can get <laughs> discounts. I cannot. Spirit is the fucking worst. Unless you want to sponsor us. I would not accept a sponsor no. from them. I would not accept a sponsor no, from I would, something I don't fucking I believe in. I would not tell people to use that. Yeah. Okay, so... And then there's people at Truckee Lake. There's 60 people at Truckee Lake. And it was 19, 19 of these 60 were adult men, 12 were adult women, 29 were children, six of whom were toddlers or younger. Like they had real young kids doing this. I don't know if I mentioned that before, but keep that in mind when all this shit's going down. There's, yeah, there's young kids here. Um, you could have. Well, I I don't know, but they're, they're family. So I just kind of assumed. Right. I shouldn't assume. I told you earlier, you shouldn't assume. So I should really take my own... Advice. advice jinx you, you owe me okay a coke uh so the four cabins were terribly fucking dirty hygiene was beyond subpar What's can you imagine that? nobody's showered since may it's fucking november and it's hot it's hot smell like a at one point it was yeah it was hot now it's cold it's like what the Yikes. fuck's going on my body's going through it i could use some fucking concealer no, I'm saying, like it was fucking hot so they probably reeked yeah for sure um you know the roofs of these cabins were made out of oxen skin, so it wasn't keeping much heat in. So they did kill the oxen. Yeah, you they gotta do what you gotta them. do. Okay. So, well, also some of them had oxen skin they were gonna use at, that, like they had before they left because they were oh. gonna use them as blankets. Oh, okay. But yeah, they pretty much were doing what they had to do. Right. Um, there was a lake nearby, but nobody fucking knew how to fish. And then the lake began freezing over. And on uh, November 29th, they realized that if they were going to survive, some members were going to have to get to this place called Johnson's Ranch, which was a little bit out of the way. But uh, they had to get food and supplies and then return if they were going to fucking make it. And they were like, let's do it before the snow gets crazy. So on December 6th, Charles Stanton, again, the dude who made it to California and came back, along with this man named Franklin Graves. Oh, also the man who I'm going to rewind really quick. The man who went to California with um with James Stan, I forget what his name was. It was like Mick Cutchin or something like that. Right. He, Mick Cutchin, because yeah. that's the last name of Shane on the L word. Okay, so thank you for remembering that. Wow, <laughs> you pay attention. So he um he had made it to California, but he got fucking sick while they were traveling, so he stayed. Of course. He stayed so Charles came back by himself. So they're literally dropping off like just family members. He didn't well, yeah, but they, the two of them went with the intention of getting supplies and coming back. But, but the one got dude got so sick, he was like, sorry, homeboy, peace and blessings. Take these peace. mules and these two Native American men. Um, so, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so Charles Stan and Franklin Graves begin making snowshoes from Rawhide and Oxbow for a few members in the group. All right. So, y'all, <laughs> it's about to get fucked up. So, on December 16th, there were 17 people which included the two Native Americans, Louis and Salvador. And one of these 17 people was 12 years old. And they volunteered to head to Johnson's ranch. So I'm going to refer to this group as the Snowshoe Party. Uh, years later, this group of 17 would be given the title Forlorn Hope. Um, and you're, you'll find out why. So they rationed enough food for six days, and they went out in the terribly snowy fucking weather. So the 16 Donner... I'm just going to like... Because this is going to be... Everybody's all over the fucking place. So okay. so the 16 Donner family members remained at Alder Creek. Uh, 43 remained at Truckee Lake, and 17 were in the snowshoe party who were going to go to this ranch and come back with supplies. So I'm going to follow a linear timeline and occasionally bounce back and forth between the snowshoe party and what was going on at Truckee Lake, but mostly the snowshoe party. Truckee Lake in the choke. That's what it reminds me of. <laughs> Matilda. So on December 17th, two of the men in the snowshoe party were unable to keep up with the snowshoers, and they had to return to camp. So now we've got 15 people. We've got five young women, nine men, and a 12-year-old named Lemuel Murphy. Uh, so the snowshoe party's progress was fucking slow. After four days, they had traveled only 14 miles, uh, which was about 3.5 miles a day. I did that math. Do you like that, baby? I love that too. You like a math magician? Oh, here's the number for you, 69. I shouldn't joke because it's about to get real fucked up. So right. now hypothermia and snow blindness set in. So snow snow, blind? snow blindness is not just when, you know, when it's, you know, really fucking bright if it snows out. Oh, right, right. Because it's, you know, the sunlight is bouncing off of off the, the snow. Well, snow. when you're outside consistently, snow blindness is actually 
the sun's UV rays that bounce off the snow and hit your eyes and can cause temporary or permanent blindness. So this shit they were dealing with, it wasn't just really bright. It was physically debilitating their sight. So back at camp, four men, including our homeboy, Jacob Donner, had died of either malnutrition or hypothermia. All right, let's get back to the snowshoe party. On December 21st, 1846, Charles Stanton, oh, bless his soul. He's been such a strong man. Right. He became too weak to continue with the snowshoe party. He sat in the snow, smoked his pipe, and told the rest of the snowshoers to go on. He was left there alone and never seen again. This man traveled all the way to California and then came back with supplies for these people he didn't know. <gasps> And he, didn't and, make it. and he didn't make it back a second time. So this one goes out to Charles Stanton. Unless he was a really fucking awful person and a racist, then this doesn't go out to him. But I didn't pick up on any of that. No, so I could be wrong. culture is real. <laughs> so uh, now the snowshoe parties, six days of food that they rationed out which was expected to hold them over, it didn't. And the group went a two went two full days without eating. And by the eighth day, one of the adult men named Patrick Dolan suggested the unthinkable. Dolan suggested that they should draw a lottery from a stack of straws and whoever got the shortest straw would be killed and eaten by the others in order to survive. So then, guess what fucking happens? Tell me. Dolan himself pulled the short straw. So... He was like willing. He was like, fuck. I mean, I said uh, we were going to do it. So y'all are going to kill me and eat me, huh? But the rest of the members, they they couldn't do it. They were like, no, I can't fucking do that. I can't eat you. That's fucked up. I'm never going to do that. Um, so they decided not to kill him. But shit for the snowshoe party got worse. That day, Patrick Dolan got hypothermia. And now a side effect of hypothermia is that you actually can feel incredibly hot. And people like remove their clothes, which Dolan did. And he ran around in the blizzard like crazy. Uh, he was completely naked. And after that little fit, he was, you know, beyond close to death. Uh, he didn't die yet, though. So the next day was not only their ninth day of their journey, but it was also Christmas Eve. And around 11 p.m., the snowstorm blew out their fucking fire. And oh. unable to create another one, the snowshoers sat in a circle, pulled a few blankets over each other, and without a tent, they laid directly on the snow as the night continued and the falling snow covered them. In the middle of the night, uh, Sarah and Marianne Graves cradled their dying, freezing father, Franklin Graves, in their arms. That's really sad. His dying wish to his daughters was that they would eat his flesh to stay alive. So the same night... No, daddy! So the same night, a young man named Antonio also died. On Christmas Day, short straw picking hypothermia streak and Patrick Dolan died of hypothermia. <laughs> wow. And uh, the rest of the snowshoe party didn't know that. So keep this in mind. The rest of the snowshoe party just witnessed three of their members die, right? These people most likely probably almost 100% die. I know they didn't have food, but they probably died of hypothermia. Um, but the other group members they thought they all died of starvation and when the youngest they member went through it 12 year old lemuel murphy he died that night the next night of hypothermia everybody was panicked that they were going to be the next to die of starvation snow so the snowshoe party did what they never anticipated on doing they split up into separate groups so no one would have to eat their own family and they carefully filleted and cooked the human remains over a fire oh. I know. In a diary later found, it was stated that the group was, quote, averting their faces from one another and weeping, end quote. That is I some would assume. heavy fucking <clears throat> shit. So they also, they weren't cannibalizing like savages. They were in survival mode, but they were being as smart as possible. So they were, um, they were filleting their, the human remains to make it portable and they were rationing it so they could survive the rest of their journey. How do you even cook that? I don't, I don't know. know what to cook. I don't fucking know. Everyone except for the two Native American men consumed their dead friends. And the blizzard continued until December 29th. So after 14 days out, this is two whole weeks, y'all. The snowshoe party was faced with a vertical rock wall, which they had to <sighs> fucking climb. Like never which get a break. I'm saying it caused their feet to bleed through their tattered shoes. So running low on food and energy, the group members roasted Franklin Graves' heart on a stick over a fire and ate it in front of his wife and daughters. 
Like, can you, like, not do that here? Oh, no. Well, on December 30th, the bodies had been consumed completely and they were out of food again. William Foster suggested that two of the Native, Native American men, Louis and Salvador, he suggested that they should be killed for food. Um, and then this dude named William Eady disagreed and he actually told Foster's ideas to the Native Americans who vanished in the woods in the middle of the night. They were like, these fucking white people are really going to fucking kill us. They watched it happen. Uh, also a reminder that the two Native American men had not consumed the humans. So since they've been out of food. Oh, shit. They're like fasting at this point. It's it's starving, baby girl. That's right. not fasting. <laughs> <laughs> that is well, they kind of chose not to eat the humans. So okay, like, but like they're fasting. Oh, Jesus Christ! So uh, the next day, William Eady managed to kill a deer, but it was too late to save fellow snowshower. Snowshower, Jesus! This guy named Jay Forstick who died in the middle of the night. Now they're thinking that guy. Snowshower. They think he died of starvation. Yeah. So then on January 8th, the snow party, uh, snowshoe party came across Louis and Salvador, the two Native American men who fled in the night. And this uh, following account comes from the diary of a snowshoer named Quinn Thornton. Quote, the morning of January 8th, they came upon the Indians laying upon the ground in a totally hopeless condition. They had been without food for eight or nine days and had been days without fire. They could not probably have lived for more than two or three hours. Nevertheless, Edie demonstrated against their being killed. I'm sorry, I don't know the lingo back then. Okay. Uh, Edie demonstrated against their being killed. Foster affirms that he was compelled to do it. Edie refused to see the dead consumed and went on about 200 yards and halted. Louis was told that he must die and he was shot through the head. Salvador was dispatched in the same manner. Their flesh was then cut from their bones and dried. So the two Native American men have now been murdered and filleted. This is some fucked up history they didn't teach you in history class, huh? Over. They were like, let's play this game called Oregon Trail. Come on, it's going to be fun. Is Come it on, about it's going to be fun. It was about this time, but it wasn't about the Donner Party. Oh, okay. So the remaining snowshoe party members rationed the food, which held them over until January 12th. So that was on January 8th. Now it's January 12th. Um, 1847 that day the snowshoers reached a native american village where the villagers shared their supplies and fed them acorn bread so at this point in the snowshoe party five women and two men were still living meaning only seven of the 17 members had survived so january 18th 1847 william Eady, who was one of the two surviving men gave a native american man a pouch of tobacco to care to half carry him to johnson's ranch that's kind of like uh, using him as a crutch um which was several miles away so when they finally make it there the settlers at johnson's ranch were fucking shook to see the sight of william they were like holy shit you've been through it okay and he literally had bloody footprints that were trailing through the snow so he stays at johnson's ranch people from johnson's ranch um follow literally follow his bloody footprints to go and find the remaining six members of the snowshoe party and then they brought them to johnson's ranch oh uh so they finally make it to safety but remember all of those people are still camping out at Truckee lake so in california on january 30th um john sutter remember the sutter the dude who paid Hastings to take these people through the cutoff, along with this Captain Edward Kern, offered three dollars a day <laughs> to that was anyone. A lot back then. I know to anybody who would join a rescue party. On February third, there was a public meeting in San Francisco to raise funds and organize a party to rescue the Donner Party. Uh, many local citizens made generous donations of money, goods, and services. And on February fifth, the first relief search party of ten men was sent out from california so february 7th 1847 in san francisco a naval officer asked none other than james f reed to join him and lead the second relief rescue party so yeah james reed's been chilling in california soaking up that milk and honey baby um so then on february 15th 1847 three of the men from the first relief rescue party turned back and seven continued on to the donner party camps and on february 18th my motherfucking birthday bitches the relief party reached Truckee lake so daniel rhodes one of the researchers recalled quote 
At sunset, we crossed Truckee Lake on the ice and came upon a spot where we had been told we would find the emigrants. We looked all around, but no living thing except ourselves was in sight. We raised a loud hello, and then we saw a woman emerge from a hole in the snow. As we approached her, several others made their appearance in the manner of coming out of the snow. They were gaunt with famine, and I can never forget a horrible, ghastly sight that they presented. The first woman spoke in a hollow voice, very much agitated, and said, Are you men from California, or did you come from heaven? So she probably literally thought she was dying. So this is what the first relief rescue found. This is at Truckee Lake. I hadn't really told you what's been going on at (laughs) Truckee Lake. So They're killing everyone, too. The people at Truckee Lake had killed and eaten their oxen and dogs. Mm-hmm. After that, they consumed their leather goods. They boiled their shoelaces, which created a disgusting glue-like substance, uh, which then they consumed. They even ate the animal skin that was being used as their roof, which kind of fucked up their cabins. And a woman... Uh, had died, and she was the first to be cannibalized by others, including her own daughter, who at the time didn't know she was eating her mother. So uh, the remaining survivors were fucking starving, and 14 of the emigrants had died at Truckee Lake. So February 22nd, the first relief, rescuers leave Truckee Lake with 23 refugees en route to California. Now, they they told the people, they're like, there's more... Um, there's other relief parties that are going to come for you. We can only take like so many people. And also they gave them the supplies they needed and like to stay warm and eat stuff and stay put until the next party came. So they weren't just abandoning these people. They were like, we know you're here. We're going to, we're figuring this shit out. Okay. So, um, the first relief only take 23 refugees to California. And two days later, John Denton was unable to continue. Uh, so the rescuers left him behind the next day. Another member named Ada Kessenberg died while traveling and was buried in the snow. February 28th, 1847, as the first relief was heading down the mountains, they actually crossed paths with the second relief who was coming up. And for the first time in nearly five months since they were separated, James Reed sees his wife and his two children. So that has to be like a sigh of relief. Like, holy shit, like I I haven't seen you and we've heard all this, yeah. Um, But he learns that two of his other kids are still at the camp. It's not really, I'm not sure why they were separated, but, that's that. So on March 1st, the second relief rescuers pass Truckee Lake and make it to Alder Creek, where the Donner family was camping. Remember, about six miles away. So George okay. Donner's body laid on the floor. His head had been cracked open uh-huh. and his brains had been eaten. The second team guided those strong enough to travel. Uh, they make it to Truckee Lake and they leave with 17 emigrants total. Uh, So three men from the rescue party actually stayed behind at the camps to help the weakened emigrants because they couldn't help each other at this point. They were like, oh, shit, y'all can't even like help your neighbor, like to get back to health. So like three of us who are healthy are going to stay. And they prepared for the next relief. So on March 5th through the 7th, the worst storm of the fucking season strikes. The second relief and the refugees are stuck they're unable so this is the second relief so they had left they're in between california and Truckee lake and uh they're fucking stuck so for two days they huddled around a fire that they could barely keep lit when the storm cleared most of the refugees were too weak to fucking move reed and his companions took three children and left the rest the rest of the people were cannibalized and that location is now known as starved camp Oh my God. So on March 7th, Elizabeth Donner and her four year old son Samuel, who were the only members of the Donner family who were left at Alder Creek, um, literally, these two last family members who were in this tent where his brains had been eaten. Um, this is so sad. Elizabeth dies, and then the four year old's kind of on his own. And a couple days later, he also died. And uh, no. Yeah, that's that. So March 12th, the third relief found the 11 survivors. And the next day they leave four or five alive at the camp. So now there's only four or five people left at Truckee Camp. So the uh, April, that was in March 12th. So this is now April 17th, 1847. The fourth uh, relief party reached Truckee Lake where Lewis Kessenberg, who was the dude who shoved the old man out of the um, the wagon, he was found and he was surrounded by half-eaten corpses 
and he is the only one alive. So he killed everybody and ate them. Uh-huh. Um, and he kind of became a famous guy a little bit later uh, um, because of the way they found him. They think he kind of like enjoyed it. Uh, I think a lot of it was sensationalized because he was made out to be the cannibal that ate his like fellow members and enjoyed it. I'm not really sure, but he was in survival mode. I wasn't there because I'm a young bitch. I'm a young bitch. So on April 21st, the fourth, the fourth relief uh, leaves the lake with Kessenberg in tow. And eight days later on April 29th, 1847, the last member of the Donner party arrives at Sutter's fort. So June 22nd, 1847, this guy uh, from California, his name is General Stephen Watts Kearney, and his troops, are, um, they trek back to the camp to see what the fuck is left. They're horrified because they have heard about ship. They haven't seen it. They gather all the cannibalized remains into one cabin and they burn everything, basically cremating them. So this actual spot where that happened. Right history. Well, they had to get rid of it. This actual spot where it happened is... Um, you can actually visit it today and it's a memorial <clears throat> that kind of acts as a gravestone and it's 22 feet high. Oh, you can look up pictures of it online um, because the 22 feet were how high the fucking snow was. So keep in mind this all what? was like, yeah, the snow was insane. They had like, had they had to carve out paths. It was fucked up. Um, so of the original 87 emigrants in the Donner Party, only 47 members survived, all participating in cannibalism of their fellow fallen travelers. And that is <coughs> the Donner Party. Yikes. It's funny because we're going on a hike after this. Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna, Please gonna... <laughs> don't chop me up and kill me. Like, I know I'm sweet beat, but oh like, God. don't do it. And my blood sugar is low. Oh, we better eat before you go. You better eat before True. you go. True. Okay. I'm baffled that it was like 40 plus plus didn't make it. Yeah, it was. A... And then like died brutally. Like, uh, yeah. And eight people. Dude, it was fucking rough. They should have taken the Oregon Trail. The fucking Oregon Trail rough. is like, it should be cursed. It's uh, Well, that wasn't the Oregon Trail. This was the haste or they took the Hastings cutoff, which took them a different direction. And that the fact that the Hastings cut off uh, along with the fact that they left a little bit late, like fucked up <clears throat> along with the fact yeah, didn't, that it didn't snowed. Didn't he think he could just go straight across? Like if they followed an actual map, they probably wouldn't have run into all this shit. Well, if they would have just went to Oregon instead of California. This probably wouldn't have happened. That's true. But also they left late. Like even though it was like a week and a half late it, and they would have taken the normal trail, I think they did. Oh, they would they have They probably been wouldn't have yeah. No, they wouldn't have been doomed. They would have been fine. Why? The snow still happened. All right, because it was late in the season. They remember they left late. Okay, they took the Hastings cut off, which took them extra days. Right. Rather than taking the normal mm-hmm. way. Um and then they, their like animals ran away and shit. It was just like oh, thing, after thing after thing after thing that yeah. was just really keeping them behind. It must have been Mercury retrograde. Probably, yeah, we'll blame it on that. Mercury was definitely in Gatorade, I'll tell you that much. Uh, but fuck, man, like that is so, and it's, again, I've said this before and I'm gonna say it again because especially, especially because this happened so long ago, it's so easy just to like think about like an old timey movie and it's just like, it seems so fictional because it's so far fetched and right. fucking insane. That, but like, this was their 40 plus plus people would die. And this was their reality. They literally were fearing their lives in these awful fucking conditions, going insane, dying of hypothermia, thinking everybody's dropping dead of starvation. They were fucking starving. And then watching like your fellow members who you've either your family members or your close friends that you've literally become close with because you've been traveling for months get fucking cut up by other people roasted and then also, eaten also um did they like intentionally kill people to eat or did they just the two native american men were intentionally murdered to eat right um right. yeah and then that was like i think that was the only one who the only ones who were murdered like to intentionally. eat yeah, yeah. Somebody who also because that's like blatant racism, <laughs> right? Let's kill the Native Americans. Yeah. Like, what the fuck? Uh, because they do say that they were like pretty much dying, but I mean, they say you know you're gonna kill and eat your dog before you kill and eat your family. You're gonna kill and eat your acquaintances. Who says that? No, I'm just saying like oh. it in a situation like this, the psychology that's behind I cannibalism. Eat you. I would starve. Oh, baby. I just want you to know that. Oh. Well, there's a dick would feed you, you would for days. Me. I know you would. 
Huh? It's. I know you would eat me. No, I wouldn't. Yes, you would. No, I wouldn't. Well, first of all, you're a vegetarian, so like you really wouldn't. Right. But, like, and you're so tiny. You're like a little snack pack. I'm like, hmm, I think I'll have a Sarah chip. <laughs> Ooh, I love the areola. It's my favorite part. Wow, look at my Ooh, this dick Just will feed you for days. <laughs> oh my god. Um I I don't know if this is true or not. I couldn't really find any claims, but I've seen it being talked about online that uh one of the children who survived had eaten himself to death because <gasps> he survived and then when he ate food he overate and it literally expanded his stomach till it blew up because his stomach was so small he hadn't eaten in months and he was a child and so he fucking like he made it that whole way he ate and he ate himself to death oh fuck i thought you meant he ate himself oh like- no, no 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 he consumed food that wasn't a human or himself um but honestly pff, i can fucking relate you ever been to old country buffet buffet Ooh, girl stuff me till i'm dead that's that. not a funny joke to say right now jonathan it's not appropriate. It's Repro- not professional. So yeah, the Donner Party. I will be posting pictures. And uh, also, I encourage you, I, I know that was a lot, but there's so much more to it. In like other people's diaries, you can really, you can literally access their diary pages oh, online and read what was going on day to day. It's it's a lot. And uh, I think they should really start teaching that in the third grade curriculum. They should. Yeah, I think that Don't be cut up your friends. Benef- Don't eat your friends. Beneficial. So, um, Andre, it doesn't ever say his last name, so... <laughs> the giant. Yeah, sure. Um, he was a Swedish man who had this idea that he wanted to take a hot air balloon uh, to the North Pole. Hundreds of people have um, looked for the North Pole before the 20th century, and he thought that he could make it happen with a balloon. I don't... Okay. Uh, fuck a hot air balloon. I'm just going to go ahead and say that right now. Um, So on February 13th, 1895, Andre described his plan in an address to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. His plan was to cross the North Pole, Pole, love that for me, his plan was to cross the North Pole, land, he predicted this, that he would cross the North Pole in six days. All right. Um, and land in Asia or Alaska and then walk to civilization. Okay. I really quick. I'm really stupid and I need to see. He was Swedish, right? Yeah. Okay. I need to see how far Sweden. <clears throat> well, I didn't get to where he wanted to go to yet because it would have ruined the story. To the North Pole. Yeah. But I didn't say where he wanted to go from. Oh. Yeah. Like it's not from Sweden. Oh, he was just a Swedish man. Yeah. Oh, honey. So the following July, this is after February 13th. 1895 got it july he was in after London. february yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yes. i'm not trying to fuck with you i'm oh. kidding oh my god i was like stop i don't yes. know july comes after february honey bee honey bee. even though time is a man-made concept and right. we're all gonna fucking die and life is a simulation and somebody's up there with a big computer mouse and we're all just the little the, fucking the sims. sims oh my god for real okay and he's just like here i'm gonna make you wash your dishes again oh somebody put a dirty dish in there I feel like even though you didn't do it i'm gonna make you do it even though it might have been somebody you live with i feel like the sims isn't real because like i mean us being sims only because like some people are really fucking lazy and I doubt that that person is just like, relax in bed, relax in bed, <laughs> relax in bed. You know what I mean? <laughs> or what was that cheat code that was like, you disable their um, their free will and they like can't do anything on their own. Oh so, my God, I've never heard of that. Yeah. I only knew Rosebud. Rosebud, girl, get that and queen. mother load. Mother load with an E at the end. No yeah, A, exactly. bitch. Load. Um, so the following July in London, he gave the speech again to the Sixth International Geographical Congress. He was 40 at this point, blonde, tall, well built Built with wide shoulders and a strong jaw. So, like, he could get the job done. Oh, love a Swedish meatball. That wasn't the Swedish accent. I don't know how the Swedish talk, actually. John edited that and out. And I quote, The history of geographical discovery is at the same time a history of great peril and suffering. He began. Peril. In, oh, <laughs> in warm climates, however, nearly every hindrance can be said to contain a means of success. Natives often bar the way of the explorer, but just as often, perhaps, they become his friends and helpers. Lakes and rivers carry him places, plus he can drink from them and can find them and can find things to eat. In the desert, despite 
the sun, there can also be a uh, luxuriant vegetation that serves oh. as a shelter. So he's just thinking that he's going to find all this food. So basically he's high as shit. He's a hippie and he's like, oh, I will find my way. Uh-huh. I will have the little camels will guide me through the desert Basically. and take me to the little cabanas right. that they have. Bruh. Did he's you ever not see, good. Did you ever see that? Um, I forget what it was. It was like a, a an extreme survivalist dude. Oh, I forget what the fucking show was. But I was scarred from this. He found a de- it was a, Yeah, I'm pretty sure he found a dead camel. This was on like the Discovery Channel or Animal Planet or something. Found a dead camel in the desert and he lived in it for the night because he was explaining how it's really hot in the day, but it gets cold as shit in the uh, at night. So he was going to live in the, the dead not, camel, the dead camel's stomach. Oh. Homeboy on TV. I wish you could see his face right now. Undigested food in this camel's stomach. And eats it. Slurps it up with his fucking hands. At least he didn't use a straw. Save the turtles. Yo, okay. Reduce that carbon footprint. So in the Arctic, he says, the cold only kills. (laughs) Oh, I've seen a penguin hold a knife before. (laughs) It was in a cartoon, but I've fucking seen it. Okay, that's a cartoon that doesn't exist. So? Nothing exists. Mind you, there was no places to rest when you're in a fucking hot air balloon. There's no vegetation and there's no fuel, so how are you gonna? Oh yeah, I forgot. He was taking a fucking. <laughs> he's taking a. He's taking a hot air balloon. How did they have hot air balloons go back then? I wish I knew. In a fucking woven basket. Oh my god, whose idea? They were like, you know what we should do? Get a big old balloon and get in a basket and just get really fucking high. I love that. And then get drift really away. fucking high. And drift away. I remember that was, okay, when we were, last time I got super fucking was that super even? stoned. This was probably, we watched this video of a piece of pizza that was in attached to a oh, hot air balloon. Four years ago? Yeah. It was attached to a hot air balloon with a GoPro camera on it. And the hot air balloon followed the pizza that like went to space. And I was bugging. He was not okay. I was not okay. I was like, turn this off. And everybody was like, wow, this is inspiration. I was like, what the fuck? Why? 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 I, and that's when I found out I don't like heights. Can you believe? Look at that. Anyway, sorry, I keep sidebarring. That's okay. So um, he describes the balloon and all the instruments he's going to need and how much the expedition's going to cost. And he says it's going to cost about $38,000. Okay. And he plans on going alone? No. Oh. As Andre listened to the objections from General Adolphus Greeley, an American explorer who had literally already done the same fucking thing, and he's basically telling him, like, this is not a good idea. Because uh, he's already done it. Right. Okay. Um, And others who thought he might get lost, he made notes with a pencil. Okay. Then he pointed, then he pointed his finger at several explorers, and said, "When something happened to your ships, how did you get back?" Greeley, on his expedition a decade earlier, had lost eighteen of his twenty-five men. Uh. So he says, "I risked three lives in what you call a foolhardy attempt, and you risked how many?" This is Andre explaining to him that he's not, since the fucking hot air balloon's so small, that he's he's not going to kill a lot of people because it's too fucking small. Oh, okay. Right. He's like, if we all die, it's only three, not 18. Basically. Roger that. Um, as Andre left the stage, a witness wrote to the audience, as Andre left the stage, a witness wrote that the audience cheered until the great hall of the Colonial Institute rang. Okay. Wait. So people are... The general public are like, yeah, Andre, do your damn thing. Basically. Okay. So, like, he went on stage. He basically, like, what is that word? He, like, was giving them a presentation of why he needs funding. Right. Okay. For this fucking hot air balloon. Right. And everybody's like, yes, honey, you do you, baby. Right. And then, but the explorers are like, not a good idea. Do right. not want. Right. Okay. Um, so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Andre. I wish you would. <clears throat> So Andre was born in 1854 in Grena, about 300 miles southwest of Stockholm, on Lake Vatteren. As a child, he was said to have a wide-ranging intelligence and a capacity for asking difficult, difficult questions and to be stubborn. So you already know he's taking this fucking balloon. Right. He ain't going to take no for an answer. Right. Andre's attachment to his mother was profound and only deepened when um, his father passed at 16. His dad was 16. No, he was probably six. Sorry, yeah. stupid. Okay, no, no. John, take that out. If he felt he 
like, was drawn to a woman, he repressed the attraction. He said he doesn't want to risk having a wife. Um, when he tells him, like, listen, I need to go do this hot air balloon shit. Peace, bitch. Okay. So, like, Right. I mean, I guess that's good that he didn't do that. He says, because at that moment, my attention for her, no matter how strong, would be so dead that nothing could call it life again. So he wants to fuck his hot air balloon, is what you're saying? Yeah, basically. Okay. Um, he attended the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, and at 22, he went to America to see the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia, where all the world's new hey, inventions were that's being displayed. Here. Right? I know. I've been there. I know that guy. <laughs> um... On the train to America, Andre had only one book. It was Laws of the Wind by C.F.E. Bajorling. Wait, his train to America? Where was he? He was in Stockholm. Where's that? In Europe. You can't take a train. Well, it said... Oh, he probably landed somewhere and then was taking a train. On a steamer. Steam... Call 1-800-steamer. No, he, you can't take a fucking train from Europe to America. That's... I know, but he probably landed here, took the train to Philly. Okay, got it. One day, reading about the trade winds, he wrote in a journal an idea that ripened in his mind, which influenced his entire life. This was what um, the thought that balloons, even though they couldn't hold up fucking anything, because where are you going to get fuel if you fucking land in water? That's just... You're fucked. <laughs> right. Um, he said that they could be used for long journeys. I'm getting nervous, and he hasn't even lifted off the ground yet. And then he thought that a balloon might cross the Atlantic. Oh, my God. I've never crossed the Atlantic, but, like, I've heard it's really big. I hold her, I, I heard it was really salty. Did I cross the Atlantic? I don't even know what that is. I don't know which is which. The Atlantic Ocean is the one, the side we're on. Because remember Atlantic City? Oh, right. And then remember Pacific Coast Academy, Zoe 101 was in California, so that's how I remember him. Wow, look at you. So smart. So mm-hmm. in Philadelphia, Andre got a job as a janitor at the Swedish Pavilion. The American ballooning pioneer, pioneer John Wise lived in Philadelphia, and Andre went to see him. Wise had flown balloons in sunshine, rain, snow, thunder showers, and hurricanes. Oh, a hurricane! Why? Right. Um. So Andre is is writing in this journal. So this is gonna come back at the end. Okay. So Andre wrote. Um. He had been stuck on chimneys, smokestacks, lightning rods, church spires, church spires. Sure. Probably those pointy ass things, right? right? He had been dragged through rivers, lakes, and over garden plots and forests. His balloon had whirled like tops, caught fire, exploded, and fallen to the ground like stones. The old man himself, however, had always escaped unhurt and counted his experiences as proof of how safe the art of flying really was. Okay, unless unless he was doing so much flying that this shit was like only a tiny percentage of how many times he was in the air. That sounds like a lot of times he's fucking crap. Maybe pick up another hobby. Maybe knit. I don't know. Buy yourself a loom. Something else. So Andre asked Wise if he could join him on a balloon ride, and Wise said that he could go up with him and his niece on July 4th in Huntington, uh, Pennsylvania. Huntington? Where the fuck is that? Huntington. Huntington? Where the fuck is that? (laughs) I don't know. Just as Wise's niece, um, dressed as the goddess of liberty, was about to board, um, a high wind rose and the bag collapsed like a rag. That's what Andre wrote. Okay, wait. So, and she was dressed like the Statue of Liberty? Statue of Liberty, yeah. Um... Okay, it's out by Harrisburg. Oh. So if you guys are listening to us, we actually do have listeners out there. So, um, hi, I'm sorry. I didn't know where you are, but now I see you loud and clear. But that's pretty far from uh, Philadelphia. Right. So um, not long after that, Andre was sick with um, an intestine problem and he returned to um, his hometown in Grana, which is in Stockholm. Okay. To make money to buy his own balloon, he and a partner opened a machine shop near John Coping. Within a few years, they were heavily in debt, and Andre decided that he didn't like business. He says, Mm. because it seemed repulsive to me constantly to say derogatory things about competitors when it came time to sell and about goods when it came time to buy. Constant striving for money killed interest, which I value very highly and which I wanted to keep alive. All right. I can kind of see where he's coming from. Right. It's like you constantly have to be like, that person sucks and that sucks. Buy this. Yeah. (laughs) That's really like sales in a nutshell. Um, In 1882, Andre went to Spitsbergen in the 
Arctic as a member of the Swedish delegation of the first international polar year, a project undertaken by 11 countries in order to study polar weather. So, you know, he wants to go to the fucking North Pole. So he was on that. Mm -hmm. Andre made observations concerning aero electricity and he did it with such resourcefulness solving te technical problems that def defeated the other nations that the swedish results were concerned were considered the best so now they're like oh well this guy figured it out maybe we will give him a chance to determine whether the yellow green tinge that appeared on someone's face at the end of the arctic winter when daylight finally arrived was a result of a person's skin having changed color or his eyes having been affected by the light andre allowed himself to be shut indoors for a month when he finally went out it was uh, clear that the pigmentation of his skin had changed what i wish i could do that and somebody paid me to do that shit frick but his response to this was dangerous perhaps but what am i worth <laughs> he just really doesn't give a fuck no. he's just like let's just do the damn thing in 1885 andre went to work at the swedish patent office um this was his last job andre didn't ride in a balloon until 1892 so this whole time he's fucking fascinating with balloons he's never been in one. Oh my god right <laughs> oh my okay uh when he was 38 oh god so remind mind you he was 22 when he started like getting into this fucking balloon shit okay any ha okay. So he went up in a hot air balloon at the first time at 38 in 1892 with Captain Francisco Setti. He was a Nor he was a Norwegian man who said that Andre was disagreeably calm. Andre wrote that he was preoccupied with observing himself to determine whether he was afraid. He was surprised to find himself as the balloon left the ground holding tight to the ropes. <laughs> <laughs> I would he too. He was shook. He discovered that um, he was not conscious of feeling any fear, but probably was influenced by it unconsciously. He wrote that in his journal as well. Probably After making a second flight with SETI, Andre was able to buy a balloon, which he did with the money from a fund established to further science uh, and the public good. Andre called his balloon the Save after a Swedish national emblem, and in it he made nine trips by himself on his first flight at 13,500 feet, he said that he heard dogs barking. On the second, he noted that the balloon fell faster when a cloud passed over it. How fast do these travel? They can't travel that fast. No, they can't. I mean, but if you... I think it's all about the fire. So I think if you, like, it goes faster. <laughs> if you just push that little yeah. go button. Pound that gabardine. <laughs> On the fifth trip, Andre ascended to 14,000 Okay, um, it says an average wind speed of five miles per hour at an average speed. That's uh, what I'm saying, and he thought he was going to get from wherever to fucking North Pole in six days? Yeah, okay. You need a month. That doesn't sound right, though. At an average wind speed of about five miles per hour, a balloon will fly two to eight miles. Is that per hour? That's not a fucking finished sentence. <laughs> Skydrifters.com slash FAQ. Esoteric Oddities is not pleased. Thank you. Change your ways. <laughs> On the fifth trip, Andre ascended to 14,250 feet. As he rose, his head began to ache. He wrote that the beating of the pulse produced a faint singing noise on the left side of his brain. Um, on the sixth trip, he used drag ropes to slow the balloon and a sail he designed to try to steer it. He also dropped cards from the balloon and hoped that people would note where they had found them and send them to him so that he would be able to tell more precisely where he had been. Well, just, <laughs> literally just drop just him don't tell crumbs. people what they're doing and just dropping notes. Okay, but also like the, he's really counting on the fact that there's people down there and it's not just like a body of water. I also could pond. be saying his name wrong the whole time. It could be like Andre. Andre. Oh fuck it, we're calling him Andre. Andre made three trips in the Save. The last on March 17th, 1895, after which he sold it to an outdoor museum near Stockholm. In all, he had traveled 900 miles and spent 40 hours um, in the sky. Andre was different from other men who went looking for the North Pole. I'm not like other men. They were explorers, whereas he was an engineer. Oh. Although he was eager to be lionized. Discovering the pole was exhilarating to his ambition, which was to prove that balloons could sail to places that couldn't otherwise be reached. Territory that had never been seen could be mapped, and the samples and photographs taken would extend 
what was known of the natural world. He wanted to be regarded as a scientist, not a performer of a stunt. Okay. According to Hawken, Jorickson, the director of the Grenau Museum, whose holdings are devoted mainly to Andre, raising money to discover the pole was easier than raising money to cross the Atlantic. Andre said, wanting to try the impossible, to go to the North Pole in a balloon, um, he realized the North Pole was where he could find the money. No one would have sponsored him to fly across the Atlantic. Oh, right. So he's like, I'm, I'm going to have to do this if I'm going to get money to it. Right. This reminds me of James and the Giant Peach, because didn't they end up in the North Pole? Yeah, it also reminds me of... Um, That's when they went underwater, right? What is that thing with Jackie Chan? Around the world in 80, 80 days. days. Yeah. In the summer of 1896, Andre was given a hero standoff from Sweden. So he was traveling from Sweden to the North Pole. Okay. Copy that. His companions were... Um, Niles Ekholm, he was a 47-year-old meteorologist who had led the expedition to Spitsbergen, and Nils Steinberg, he was 23 years old, and he was assistant professor of physics and a cousin of the writer August Steinberg. So, these people were cousins. Right. Around the World in 80 Days was written, I think, 20 years before this happened. Oh, shit. Oh, So, he probably read it, and he was like, oh, I'm gonna do this. Fuck that. Right. So that the balloon could be filled without interference from the wind, Andre had a five-story balloon house built on Danes Island. Oh, my God. In Norway. I don't know what that word is, so I'm not going to say it. That's fine, Norway. Let's go. The front wall of the house could quickly be pulled down when the balloon was ready to lift off. The floor, as well as every part of the house that might touch the balloon, was covered with heavy felt. The windows were made from gelatin, and the roof was cloth. What kind of... Ch- it wasn't a house. It was just like when they released it, the house would basically break apart and the the balloon would ascend. Wait. Well, then why are his windows are made out of jello? I don't know. I can't... I don't well, know. it was probably because... They probably did it because it was like lighter than glass. Right. But also like, y'all got some wind blowing. You can't have no jello windows in right. this bitch. Right. The fuck? For three weeks, Andre tried to leave when he never got favorable winds having to return to sweden and set about raising money again was a setback that winter at home resigned saying that he doubted that the balloon could retain sufficient hydrogen to make the trip he was replaced by nut franklin a 27 year old civil engineer nut franklin it's k-n-u-t oh, nut <laughs> nut franklin. <laughs> franklin i love that it's actually frain Cal. Oh, Nut Frankel. <laughs> Nut Frankel. <laughs> wow. Uh-huh. I'm not even high. In 1897, shortly before the team left for Spitsburg, and again, Strideberg's father held a farewell dinner. Andre was unable to attend because mother, his mother had unexpectedly died, and he was attending the funeral. Oh, his mom didn't even get to see him do this. Right? Uh Strindsberg's father saw Andre a week later as the three explorers were leaving and wrote that he was calm as the summer sea. Privately, however, Andre grieved deeply. Andre wrote in his journal, the only thread which bound me to the wish to live is cut off. Oh, that makes me so sad. He, he loved was so his, mom. his mom. Oh, my right. husband. Oh, sorry, Andre. Andre and his team arrived at Danes Island in May. Strindberg wrote to his brother, with a fairly strong wind, we will reach the pole or a point near it in 30 to 60 hours. Once having reached the northmost point, we don't care where the wind carries us. Of course, we'd rather land in Alaska near the Mackenzie River where we would very likely meet American whalers who are favor- favorably disposed toward the exposition. It would really be a glorious thing to succeed so well, but even if we were obligated to leave the balloon and proceed over the ice, we shouldn't consider ourselves lost. We have sleds and provisions for four months, guns and ammunition. We are well equipped more than other expeditions. As far as that is concerned, I would not object to such a trip. So that's what this person wrote in a letter. Right. A porn star just mentioned me on her story. I love that for you. I want to say a porn star Evelyn Claire just mentioned me. Let me see what she's saying. What does she say? Oh, she reposted my um <laughs> my story. <laughs> what was your story? Every time I about to have sex, I grab a stick and try it. I chew it up. I rip off a chunk and I jam that little piece of gum in the pee hole. It's better than one of the plugs being like, "I love shit." <laughs> like, what even is that? 
Okay, sorry. Wow. Um, um, a porn star posted me on her story. I love that. Thanks, Evelyn. So as the balloon left the balloon house on July 11th, the balloon struck something. And the last thing Andre was heard to say was, what's that? <gasps> Wait, he died? No. Oh, fuck. The balloon rose a few hundred feet and headed northeast across the harbor. Within moments, it began to descend. And then the basket abruptly <gasps> struck the water to oh my raise God. it. Oh, no. Andre and the others threw out nine bags of sand, about 450 pounds, which they would have preferred to keep. <sighs> Damn, they've been in this for like, what, 10 minutes? Right. The balloon appeared to be traveling towards the horizon at about 20 miles an hour, according to a witness who wrote, For one moment then, between two hills, we perceived a gray speck over the sea very, very far away. Then it finally disappeared. <gasps> oh, my God. You're making me so nervous. The anticipation is killing me. Are you ready? Yeah, I think. So, um, on August 5th, 1930, a Norwegian slope called the... I'm just going to call it the Brat. It was sailing (laughs) in the Arctic Ocean, stopped at a remote island called White Island. The Brat was partly on a scientific mission led by Dr. Gunnar Horn, a geologist, and partly out just sailing. On the second day, the sailors followed walruses around the point of land a few hours later they returned with a book which was heavy and really really wet its pages stuck together oh the no book it's was his... a diary <gasps> and on the first page someone had written the sludge journey 1897 horn rode to shore with brass captain peter who said that two sailors had gone looking for water crossing a stream the sailors found an aluminum lid which they picked up astonished continuing they saw something dark protruding from a snowdrift, oh, no. a canvas boat, oh, no. and the boat hook stamped Andre's Pole Expedition, 1896. Not far from the boat was a body that leaned against a rock. The body was frozen, and its oh, God. and on its feet were boots partially covered by snow. Very little but bones were made on the torso and arms. The head was missing, and clothes were scattered about, leading Horn to conclude that the bear's head disturbed the remains. I said, you know what? If it's not going to be a penguin with a knife, it's going to be a polar bear. It's <laughs> my had, second most right. dangerous animal. He had the others carefully open the jacket when they saw a large monogram A. They knew. <gasps> they knew. And who then, they oh were my God, is this, this is a. this is the plot of Pretty Little Liars, and they found A. Oh, but we still don't know who it is because they're decapitated. Oh, my God. That would have been a better ending than what it actually ended. It's on. <laughs> Come on. I'm trying to. The discovery of the camp and the diaries in 1930 was reported throughout the world, and the diaries were published with commentary as Andre's story. Several weeks after Horn and the Brat had been to White Island, the um, Isborn, which was a ship hired by reporters, stopped there, and one of the reporters... His name was Nut, but it wasn't the other one. Oh, we got um, another Nut. <laughs> found a waterlogged notebook which he dried in his cabinet i have seldom if ever experienced a more dramatic more touching succession of events um this Um, was what this for this like current nut wrote right um then when i began the preparation of wet leaves thin as silk and watched how the writing and drawing at first invisible gradually became that is dramatic as fuck okay Watch it be like someone's dumb diary. Like, if somebody found my diary after putting in this much work, they'd be really disappointed. Right. So, this diary described a description um, of unexpected and amazing details, which allowed um, this nut guy to follow the journey of the balloon across the ice during three short days from July 11th to the 14th, to 14th 1897. So, those people in the balloon only survived for three days. Oh, my God. And they weren't found until 1930. 1930 in august oh fuck so they just went missing (laughs) wow yeah damn Mm -hmm. what happened to the other two bodies we don't know no one knows the The only person that's fine that that was found was andre and that is the story of andre's hot air balloon oh my god expedition oh girl Woo. Right? You can't pay me to get into a hot air balloon. Not alone, after that. <laughs> let alone travel in the fucking cold. They got polar bears and fucking penguins with shank you. No shanks. <laughs> um, would you ever get in a hot air balloon? Fuck no. Yeah, I know I wouldn't. I, I mean, would like, if it, it was like one of those like stupid ones where it's like, oh, I'm gonna go like one place to another like really quickly. Mm-mm. That's fine. Mm-mm. I Why wouldn't not? do that shit. I I do not like heights. What if 
it was like attached to a string and you didn't really go anywhere. No, oh, you, I could still like fucking fall. That has nothing to do with anything. Okay, that would that would assure me that I wasn't going to go any higher unless the fucking rope broke. I my anxiety. You would. Oh, you know what? I I would just get zanned out. I wouldn't even enjoy myself. <laughs> I would literally. It's not funny to joke about, but it's I would not. have to have my Xanax. I was, I was like, laughing I can't at you do it. saying. No, I know. It's okay. You'd have to be. We just have to be super apologetic because, you know, everybody gets really offended. They and do, then yeah. Mm-hmm. Send us emails. Uh, love that for us. Do you us. have a twit of the week? Um, I do. And it's actually from um, my tweet of the week. Oh, God. It's was, yours. No, it's not mine. (laughs) It was sent to me by Janine. Oh, my God. True Crime Girls. I have such a lesbian crush on her. Um, Don't tell her I said that. Oh, sure won't. (laughs) Where was that post? Tell me it's gone. Oh, my God. Did she text it to me? No. Where the fuck is it? Oh, my God. Tell me it's gone. Maybe it's on Twitter. No. Oh, my God. It's gone. Hold on. Hold, please. All right. I'm going to say mine. This is by um, K at... Kayler will. She says, when you win after being doubted, you will never care about an outside opinion ever again. Ooh, true. Okay, I found it. All it right. says, uh, this is a retweet. So, the Eric Alper um, tweeted, Dolly Parton, it's a picture of Dolly, and it says, Dolly Parton, 1976, she wrote Jolene and I Will Always Love You on the same day. On the same day. And somebody um, retweeted and said wow she was going through it that day okay jolene jolene (laughs) jolene jolene so then so that's my tweet of the week so thanks janine and my fun fact actually comes from my own goddamn knowledge that um i will always love you wasn't about her lover it was about like a platonic uh relationship friendship actually she had with her music producer when she had to like move on she wrote like that was her last song with him and she wrote like i will always love you like i hope you do the best for you i'm gonna do the best for me isn't that interesting that that song's actually about like a friendship also that's what i'm saying like people are that's why, like, people, I think, play into meanings of songs too much because, like, you don't even know. That's true, but also, like... <laughs> but it's, it, like, your opinion, basically. That really is, especially when Whitney Houston did it. Like, also, a lot of people don't... <coughs> excuse me. A lot of people don't know that's a Dolly Parton song. I Will Always Love You? Yeah, that's Dolly Parton wrote that. It's her original. Hi. I feel like there's all these covers of songs that no one knows about because they're so outdated. Yeah, like, like... I love that. You were the one who told me that... What's that karaoke song you sing all the time? Oh, cold and I am saying, lying naked on the floor. What Torn. is that song? Torn. That's a cover. It is a cover. You told me that. I didn't know that. Right. I... That's going to be my fun fact. I'm oh, saying. okay. <laughs> um, in 1518, a dancing plague took over the town of France. I heard about that. I was actually going to do an episode on that. No way. Yeah. That's funny. Maybe I'll get into details you later. Not saying that and then like. <laughs> No, it's so I'm probably not going to do it. Oh, 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 I'm not going to. John, edit that out or leave it in, whatever you want to do. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you. You know where to find us always. We are about to go on a hike. We are. I'm going to probably eat you if I get hungry. A little snack pack. Please don't. I'm gluten free. (laughs) Oh, even better. (laughs) But um, if you guys want bonus episodes when we get done our hike, we are recording a new bonus episode that will be going out if you would like a bonus episode along with access to our backlog of uh, bonus episodes that are already out. You can go to patreon.com slash esoteric oddities. Thank you so much for Yay! those of you guys who participate over there. We greatly appreciate it. Seriously, it means the world to us. I know I say it a lot and I know everybody fucking says it, but seriously, it really it means really, a lot to us. I, if I didn't do this, I would have no creative outlets. So like, <laughs> I'm saving myself. Yes, you're saving us from saving ourselves. Right. Uh, also, tell an ugly friend or a pretty friend to listen to us. That also helps us out a lot. And um, reviews on Apple definitely fucking help us out, even though it doesn't seem like it. If you leave a five star and a little I review. I literally was having a bad day. And like, I'm not going to lie, like doing a podcast every week, you know. It's a lot. It, it, is, it is. But then lot. when you read those reviews, it really makes it worth it that you know that there are people out there who, who really listen, enjoy yeah. like the shit that you say and mm-hmm. the shit you do and the things you're interested in. And it's like a fucking family that it's like I know, we're it's all cute. into the same shit. It's so. al- it is also like a very weird like I'm used to, you know, YouTube. I up, if oh I God, upload a video. Are very mean on there. They can be. I'm lucky enough that they're not on yeah. my page, knock on wood. But like if I upload a video, I see comments and like I, it's like an immediate, you know, it's interaction between instant graphic. Well, yeah, but immediate. 
you know, I could have a conversation oh, with people and see what they're thinking. But like when you're doing a podcast, it's kind of like you and I are having In a conversation a with each yeah. other. We're doing this shit and then we kind of like upload it and there's nowhere to comment on it. Mm-hmm. So it's like we can't even really see unless you guys like message us, which right. you do and email us, which is great. Um, but unless people are going out of their ways to do that, we don't really get that interaction with people. So it's kind of just like here. And I mean, yeah, we see our numbers and we can like see that people are listening to us and we are growing. Um so hi to our new listeners but like it's it's nice when you see like oh shit these numbers are people who listen and enjoy it and actually have been kind enough to go out of their way and to listen every week yeah and then leave like a leave a a review so thank you guys it really does help us out a lot it helps other people find us um so if you could just leave us a review on apple podcast even if you don't listen to us on apple podcast it still helps us out over there um what else was I going to say? I think that's it. Thank you guys so much for listening to Thank Esoteric you. Oddities. It's starting to get nice out. So like you get to find out if your depression <laughs> is real or fake. <laughs> uh, today's the day. Bye. <laughs> Bye.